Good morning, and welcome to the third episode of Coffee with Casey. I'm Casey Hicks, a shareholder and the Chicago Officing Office Managing Attorney here at Weltman. We've had a few technical issues uh, here this morning, so please bear with us. I want to thank everyone for signing on to this session and for submitting questions during registration. I'm looking forward to discussing bankruptcy today. This morning, Mona and I are enjoying our dark matter coffee. <laughs> and we're also wondering what all of you are drinking out there. So please feel free to tell us uh, in the chat uh, feature. And good morning to you, Mona. Uh, thank you for being my guest today and being patient with our technical difficulties. And a little bit about Monette. She's originally from Ohio, but she's lived in Chicago for 22 years. She's two times a Buckeye. She went to Ohio State or the Ohio State the University, University for both <laughs> undergrad and law school. She's been working here at Weltman since 2000. She's licensed to practice law in Illinois, Ohio, and Maine, as well as eight bankruptcy courts in five different states. During her time outside of work, she enjoys reading mystery and suspense novels, cooking, and working out. So welcome, Monette. Thank you. And just a few reminders before we get started. Uh, this is an interactive session, so please submit any questions that you have for Monette or me uh, <laughs> throughout our presentation through the question button in the control panel. Also, this webinar is being recorded, and at the conclusion of today's session, you will be sent a link to the recording. Um, lastly, there will also be a short survey on your screen at the conclusion of the event. We appreciate any feedback or any suggestions for topics that you have in the future. And finally, before we get started, we must go through the webinar legal notice. Uh, this seminar presentation will provide information concerning potential legal issues, concepts, factual situations, and information. This seminar and the material provided is not a substitute for legal advice from qualified counsel on any matter, including similar or exact factual scenarios that may be pro provided or proposed. This presentation is not created or designed to address the unique facts or circumstances that may arise in any specific instance, and you should not and are not authorized to rely on this content, content as a source of legal advice. The presenters advise you to seek competent legal advice on these topics. The seminar or seminar material does not create any attorney-client relationship between you or the law firm of Weltman, Weinberg, and Reese. And with that, we will get started. So, Monette, I'll kick it over to you. All right. Um, we have a PowerPoint presentation for you today, and I am not going to bore both you and myself by uh, reading from it. What I would really prefer is to have an interactive session. Um, as you provide questions, I will provide answers. And we have a few questions that people had sent us prior to the seminar that I think we can get started with right away. That is correct. All right, Mona, what is necessary to file a motion? Is it necessary to file a motion for relief from stay before picking up collateral? Well, it depends on the timing. If the bankruptcy is still active and the debtor has not received a, a discharge, yes. The only exception to that is if it's a Chapter 13 case, and the plan provides that the state, the plan provides that they are surrendering the collateral and that the stay will be lifted upon confirmation. So once the plan is confirmed in that instance, you can pick up the collateral without a motion for relief. Okay. Now, just could you give us just a brief explanation of the differences between a chapter seven and a chapter 13 for all our new, maybe new bankruptcy people out there? Sure. Um, imagine a chapter seven is what's considered a liquidation. So the, the concept is that the debtor puts all of their property, all of their assets, everything they own into a pot. And then that pot is used to pay off creditors. Most most chapter seven bankruptcies are no asset, which means that even if you sold everything that the debtor owned, they still wouldn't pay off their creditors. So basically they walk away from that um, with, without having any debts hanging over them, except for 
the obvious student loan debts, um, any lien collateral that, you know, the liens will, will remain. A chapter 13, on the other hand, is for people who want to keep their assets. They want to keep their house. They want to keep their car, but they're behind on their payments. So they can use that to catch up on their payments, maintain regular payments, and come out on the other side with a discharge, still owning all of their property. Okay. Now, both of those, a chapter seven and a 13, will have an automatic stay. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Anytime anyone files under any, any flavor of bankruptcy, there is an automatic stay. Think of a big, huge red stop sign. You just stop doing everything you're doing. Do not take any further action. Uh, dismiss any you know collection actions you may have pending in state court. You are now in the bankruptcy case with the debtor, and that is where you seek to uh, find your remedies uh, to to collecting your debts or getting your collateral. Now, now a co-debtor stay exists in a Chapter 13, but it does it also exist in a Chapter 7? No. This is only in Chapter 13, and it's only for consumer debts. So if you have a business debt in a Chapter 13, and it's uh, co-signed by a non-filing uh, co-signer, um, you can go after that business debt. But if it's, you know, it, which is very, very common, a car, you know, a parent signs for a car, or, you know, a, a sibling signs for a car, then there is a, a co-debtor stay and you cannot collect and you cannot repossess that collateral from the non-filing co-signer without getting co-debtor relief. Okay. Um, now, in order to terminate an automatic stay, is it always necessary to file a motion for relief? No. Um, when a debtor obtains a discharge, that is when the stay is automatically lifted by law. So if you want to wait, like in a chapter seven for the discharge, you can, but that's a risk because you don't know if the debtor is um, properly insuring the vehicle. Um, it's risky. If the case dismisses, the automatic stay evaporates. Um, and no, normally, I mean, there's also the closing of the case, but normally the discharge or dismissal happens before that. So that's your operating. That's when the stay is no longer in effect, discharge or dismissal. Okay. And if a creditor chooses to wait for a Chapter 7 proceeding to conclude by um, discharge, about how long does that, how, how long is that? Um, six to seven months in a normal Chapter 7. So, you know, so that's that's a serious amount right of time amount. Yeah. to have your collateral out there kind of hanging in the balance. Um, now, is it necessary to file a proof of claim in a Chapter 7? Normally, you don't file a proof of claim in a Chapter 7, ever. Um, but in the rare occasion when there are, there are assets for the trustee to administer, that is, the trustee can recover money from something and will be able to pay unsecured creditors you can file, you will be noticed and then you would file an unsecured claim you never file a secured claim in chapter seven because the trustee is is assuming that your collateral is your claim that's what you will recover on And creditors would be notified if they needed to file a proof of yes. claim in a Chapter 7. Month. Yes, there will be a notice of assets and a claims deadline will be on. Notice. Okay, and how, how long usually is the deadline out? How much time do creditors usually have? Oh, well, that's a good one. I would say <laughs> probably about 60 days. I'm not sure, but I think it's 60 to 90 days. Okay, okay. Okay, could you tell us a little bit about the difference between a motion for relief from stay and abandonment? Um, the motion for relief allows you to get your collateral. The abandonment is basically the trustee, when a chapter seven is filed, the trustee has the right to all of the collateral in, in the case. That, the, kind of comes into the trustee's purview. You know, the estate goes into the trustee's lap. Um, 
And what the trustee can do is abandon that collateral um, from the estate. Say, I, I don't want this, it's not worth anything to me, which is 99% of the time true. Um, and that's that then allows you to just dispose of your collateral. Now in Chicago, in my jurisdiction, we don't need to seek abandonment. There's there's just too much business here when the bankruptcies are, are up and running like they used to be. Um, but the understanding is that if if you recover anything on your um, on the sale of your collateral or the foreclosure, then you just turn it over to the trustee. Um, so, but in other jurisdictions, you do need to get a trustee abandonment in order to sell. Okay. Okay, Re reaffirmation. Can you tell us a little bit about reaffirmation? Is it in both chapter seven and chapter 13, or do you see it in one of the chapters more predominantly? Um, reaffirmations only exist in chapter sevens. And what this is, is that by signing a reaffirmation agreement, the debtor is saying, I'm signing on to this debt and it's going to pass through the bankruptcy completely intact. I am still bound by the terms of the agreement. It's not subject to a discharge. So they would be liable on, the, on any um, personal liability as well as for the collateral. Okay, and I see on the bottom of this slide that credit unions are exempt from the undue hardship provision. I know we have a lot of credit union people on the webinar, so is that always the case or are there any exceptions to that undue there, hardship? There are no exceptions to the credit union exemption. You, know, you can, debtors can reaffirm any credit union that they want. Okay, all right. Well, that's, <laughs> that's awesome for our credit unions out there. Um, we did have a question come in, jumping back a little bit to... Uh, motions for relief from stay. Is a motion for relief from stay required if the trustee abandons the asset? Yes, those are two separate things. Okay. Under two separate things of the code, yes. Because the automatic stay is still in effect if you don't get relief from stay. All right, redemption. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this this is not so popular since um, the BAPSIPA amendments because the debtors have to pay the full retail value of the vehicle. And normally their cars probably aren't worth the full retail value, but it's, it's useful when a debtor has paid down the debt significantly and they just want to buy it out of the bankruptcy and they basically what they do is they find a lender that is willing to loan them an amount of money and you can always object to if you think it's too low what they're proposing is too low and then try to get more um but it, it's not done as often as it used to be done but it's it's done okay okay we did have another question come through um what recourse uh, what recourse does a lender have if the debtor does not pay their Chapter 13 plan besides asking for a lift of stay? Anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, you could do a motion to dismiss, but the trustees do that if they're not making their payments. Um, it, it, you know, you can try to contact the debtor's attorney and they will ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because there's nothing before the court to make them act. Um, it, that's really the only remedy. Okay, okay. Moving over to chapter 13 a little bit more. I know you've kind of already covered this. Now in chapter 13, there's a plan that's filed. Um, what do you look for when the chapter 13 plan is filed in order to protect your clients? Well, um, if it's a vehicle, I look to see if it's included in the plan, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, what is the proposed secured value? We have what's called a 910 rule. So if this vehicle was purchased within 910 days of filing the bankruptcy, which is about two and a half years, um, they have to pay the full amount. They can't cram it down. But if it's a 506 claim, that is it's outside of the 910 days, they have to pay the retail value of the vehicle as the secured value. So I look to make sure that um, that the, the collateral is treated right. If it's um, 
uh, real estate, I'm going to look and see and make sure it's included. How is it treated? Is the debtor going to pay this directly? Or is the trustee going to pay? Which is unusual. Normally, if there are arrears, the trustee will pay the arrears. And then the debtor will make direct payments towards, um, to the creditor. So that's pretty much what I look at. Okay. And then if you see a situation where um, a lender or client is not treated adequately or appropriately within the plan, would you then file an objection? Yes. Yeah. An objection to confirmation. And how is that objection usually? Is there a court hearing or how is that handled? Well, theoretically, there's always a hearing. I mean, there's always a hearing on confirmation. But I rarely go to these because I work them out. Um, the debtors and creditors bar, the attorneys just know this is part of their job. So what we do is we talk to one another. Um, sometimes I just get amended plans with what I requested because they don't, this isn't worth the time and money to argue over. So if we file an objection, 99.9% .9 of the time, we're going to get a good result. Okay. Um, before we move on to proof of claims, we did have another question that came through. Um, for an auto loan, which was not reaffirmed, is it acceptable to repossess a vehicle after discharge, even if the loan is current? No, because now you are subject to state law and you can't repossess a vehicle under state law without having a reason under the contract, which would be default. default. Okay. Now, proof of claims. I know we talked about this a little bit for Chapter 7 proof of claims, but tell us a little bit about proof of claims in a Chapter 13. You have to file a proof of claim if you want to get paid. And you have to file a proof of claim timely if you want to get paid. And that includes all secured claims. So if you have a vehicle or you have a mortgage, you have to file that proof of claim to get. It used to be that you didn't have to file the claim because the lien uh, kind of substituted in a way, but no, not any longer. Um, courts will deny late file secured proofs of claims. So get your claims on file. Uh, what is the typical time frame for the proof of claim deadline in a Chapter uh, 13? About 90 days after the 341 meeting, I believe it is. Okay, and the 341 meeting is? Oh, it's set <laughs> by the court, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> different jurisdictions is different. Topics. Okay, okay. But you will get notices of all of that. <laughs> okay. Um, we did have another question that came through. Um, does filing a UCC lien protect collateral in the event of a bankruptcy in the event a bankruptcy is filed before the lien is in place? No, that would be a violation of the automatic stay when the, at the moment that a bankruptcy is filed, everything stops, automatic stay, that's it. You can't file a UCC to try to protect your lien. You know, everything's done, You, it's that is it. So you can't take any actions after the bankruptcy is filed to do anything to protect or collect your debt. Okay. Um, we had another question come through. Thank you guys so much for all your questions this morning. We do appreciate it. Um, in reference to repossession on a non-reaffirmed loan after discharge, if the loan is current but there is no valid insurance, is it legal to repossess the vehicle? Absolutely, if your contract says that is a default. Yes. Yeah, that would be an event of default. Yeah. Then. Okay, we also had a question that was submitted for a chapter 11, even though we're not really on chapter 11s today, but let's let's see what it says. Can we object to a cram down in a chapter 11 bankruptcy? Absolutely. And Erin, I, I see that you submitted that question. Absolutely you can. Um, the same, we don't have the retail value rule in chapter 11, but we certainly can object to valuation in a chapter 11. Okay. Okay, mortgage proof of claims. I think you touched on this a little bit, but there are certain documents that have to be filed with a mortgage proof yeah. of claim. Is that right? Yes, it's it's more complex. Um, we have to file an attachment to the proof of claim, which shows the arrearage and just you know the calculation of the arrears. And it can be quite complex um, when there are 
substantial arrears. Um, and it, it's it's difficult to do, <laughs> but it's it's necessary. So um, you know, we do it. We just or I've seen creditors actually do their own and they do a fine job. So um, can you cram down a mortgage lien in a bankruptcy? In a that no. Um, if it's a residence, if it's solely a residence, you cannot. But say it's rental property, yes, you can. Or say it's a duplex. You know, there are the debtor lives on one side and they rent out the other side. Yes, they can. Okay, we did talk about motor vehicle claims a little bit. Is there anything else you want to make sure people out there knew about motor vehicle proof of claims? Um, not really. Just remember the 910 rule that, you know, if that loan was incurred within 910 days of filing the bankruptcy, they have to pay the full amount. That is an automatic, you will always win objection. Um, if they are cramming your vehicle down, you are entitled, and I always ask for the clean retail value, and we can negotiate. But those are those are the most important things. Um, the interest rate we've got a what we call the till interest rate after a Supreme Court case, and that's tied to the um, oh what do you call it the going rate <laughs> <laughs> the going interest rate out there. <laughs> <laughs> and and we we add like one to three percent onto that just to because of the risk of the bankruptcy. So if you see there's no interest, then that's that's an objection as well. Okay. Prime rate, that's what it is. Prime rate, yeah, yeah. Yay. We need more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, objections. We did touch on this a little bit. Um, different objections for secured claims. What about an unsecured claim? Would there be any reason to object to the treatment of an unsecured claim? Not not usually. Um, the trustees generally take care of that because they're making sure that the debtor pays what they need to pay. What you need to pay to the unsecured creditors in a plan is what they would receive in a, in a chapter seven case, if they file chapter seven. So, you know, they may have assets, and that's one of the reasons why people file Chapter 13s is because they do have assets. And, you know, so if you liquidated everything that they own, their unsecured creditors would get 10% um, on their claims. That's what they would have to pay in the plan. And we don't get involved with that. The trustees do. Okay. Okay. The other thing is if it's potentially a non-dischargeable debt, Know, credit card claims where you know they load it up before filing or um, a student loan if somebody says well my student loans are going to be discharged in the plan well yes we would object <laughs> okay. and what can you speak a little bit about this surrender and full satisfaction language why should people be on the lookout for that oh because that cuts you off from having an unsecured claim and that's important if there is, uh, you know, a good distribution to unsecured creditors. Basically, they're saying we're going to treat this like it would be in Chapter Seven. We're just going to give you back the car, or we're going to give you back the real estate, and whatever you get is whatever you get, and you don't get to file an unsecured claim. Mm -hmm. So you need to watch out for that. Okay. And we did speak about motions for relief from stay a little bit. So if anyone out there has any additional questions for us today, um, please let us know. Um, put them right through to the chat. Um, we've enjoyed speaking with you guys this morning with our coffee. <laughs> um, we very much appreciate your patience with our technical difficulties this morning. Um, we do have our next episode set as well. Um, it will be uh, featuring a uh, fellow Chicago attorney, Laura Alms, and we will be discussing powers of attorney and guardianship. We'll be sending out the registration details soon, so please stay tuned for that. Um, as a reminder, um, at the conclusion of this webinar, a short survey will pop up on your screen. Uh, please share your feedback with us. Again, let us know if you have any future topics that you would like to see discussed. And thank you so much for attending this morning and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye. <laughs>